Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. So um, this video comes out of the fact that uh, we've been talking a little bit online about um, small sword fencing, the modern practice in HEMA of small sword fencing, um, using different types of simulators. Um, so some people use um, actual small sword sort of replicas essentially, which are usually an epée blade with a small sword hilt. Um, and I've been, you know, wondering why more people don't use foils. Um, not necessarily to say exactly the same as modern foils, but we know that historically, for example, in the 18th century, they were using uh, foils much like these. This is actually a 19th century one, but the 18th century ones are very similar to this. Um, and the difference between the um, epée blade, which I've got one of here, and the foil blade is that the epée blade is triangular in section, more like a real small sword, whereas the foil blade is square in section. Um, now, the difference, the material difference between those two things is that the square blade is generally speaking cheaper to make, um, but the square blade is usually more flexible. Um, and it is less physically like the actual small sword. So um, I think for, partly for that reason, partly for stiffness and partly for looking more like the real thing, in other words, one of these, uh, people prefer an epee blade because it looks more like a small sword blade. But we have to acknowledge that in period, they actually used foil blades. They used square foil blades. Now, we don't know if they had. They had epee blades, they had blunt triangular blades, but they didn't use those, as far as we know, really for practicing small sword fencing. They actually used square foil blades. We don't know why, and that's an interesting topic to discuss in another video. Um, but what I thought we could do here is compare the weights and balance points on some different small sword-like weapons. Okay, so I've assembled, it, I've assembled the, the related uh, items that I have. They're, these are all antiques with the exception of this one, which um, I was going to say I use for fencing. I did use for fencing. I've actually retired it because it got a bit too bent in the blade and I think it's too work hardened, not very safe to use anymore, but it is complete and therefore we can weigh it and balance it. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's have a look at these. So first of all, we've got, you've seen most of these items before, I think, in previous videos. So this is a, a George III era, Napoleonic era, uh, officer's small sword. Um, it's, we know that because of the markings on the blade. This is a earlier, probably about 1730, 1740 perhaps, um, probably English, could be French, um, Collishmard small sword. For those of you who haven't seen my Collishmard videos, that's this broadened section here, defines that as a Collishmard. So this is the standard triangular section hollow ground small sword blade. This is the Collishmard blade. And I've done some videos about those, so uh, look those up, just search for small sword in my videos. Okay. Um, then we've got three antique foils, okay, we're going to measure those, um, weigh those and, and, and measure them as well, okay, and look at the balance points. Um, then we've got what's called an epée de combat, or uh, in, <laughs> an English person would say epée de combat, okay, in other words, um, it's an epée blade but it's a sharp one intended for duels of honour to first blood, sometimes they were fatal I guess, um, but um, it is essentially a sharp epee. So what you see in modern epee fencing, that's the practice weapon for this. So this is sort of the 19th century uh, descendant of the, of the small sword. Okay, so the small sword in the 18th century was this, and the practice weapon of it was this, but in the 19th century, small sword dueling had kind of lulled, pistol dueling came more in, and then they brought back the sharp small sword, but because the 18th century had passed, this design had sort of gone away, so they had kind of almost reinvent it again, and they came back with this. So this is the 19th century version of this. This is not the practice weapon, this is the actual dueling weapon. And then finally, we've got two items which are very unusual. I don't think I've shown, I may have shown one, of, in fact, I have shown one of these before in previous videos, but I haven't done a video specifically about it. And this is an epee blade, exactly like the epee de combat blade. And you'll notice they're the same length and pretty much the same width, same design. But this one is made by Wilkinson and is on a Scots Guards officer's hilt. And this actually belonged, this specific sword belonged to the uh, colonel in charge of the Scots Guards in the late 19th century. And it's um, also got a squared grip, much like the um, 
foils that we've got down here. So not only did they put an, an epee blade on, essentially a dueling blade on, and this is not this is his dress sword. So this is not his. This is not the sword he would have carried on campaign. He would have had a saber, but this is the sword he would have worn about town. Uh, for, and um, he, we know that he was a keen fencer. I've actually got a picture of him in his fencing gear, um, and the square grip is very clearly to emulate the square grip that we get on these um, foils. Um, and then finally, the French officer's equivalent, same kind of thing, it's got a squared grip, it's got a form of the 1880, um, 1882 guard, infantry officer's guard, but the blade is absolutely an epee blade. Okay, it's a little bit smaller, a little bit lighter than the British one, and a little bit smaller and lighter than the Epée de Combat. It's quite a, it's quite a dainty one, this. Right, so, let's go through some, some weight. So first of all, I'm going to measure the um, standard um, small sword. Okay, so um, that is zeroed. So this first one is... And I'm going to tell all weights in grams, okay, it seems the best measurement to use that. This is 420 grams, okay, 420 grams, which is quite similar to some modern fencing weapons. The point of balance is to get my uh, tape measure out, and I'll do all this in centimetres for you, it seems the most applicable. So, the point of balance is there, which is uh, six and a half centimetres from the guard but bear in mind that this has fairly large finger rings in there okay so uh, and the blade length of this one is oh so this is a feat of uh <laughs> let's do it this way there we go The blade length is 81 and a half centimetres, okay, so 81 and a half centimetres, uh, and that weighs 420 grams. Right, let's dispose with that one, and move on, put my tape measure down here, I've got too many things. So the Kulish mud um, that we talked about before, let's see what the weight of that. Some people would assume, looking at it, that it's going to be a lot heavier, because it looks broader, but remember that it's hollow ground, so every surface is um, concave, okay, so there's actually not an awful lot of steel in this and it weighs only a slight bit more than the other one actually it's 400 and 470 i would say 470 grams okay um the point of balance as you can see is i'm not going to i'm not going to measure all of the point of balances actually but you can see it's just a few centimeters up from the from the guard there and the blade is 77 centimeters so this is a little bit shorter um, but it's a different weapon for a different purpose but there we go so the first one 420 grams this one about 470 grams so we do have about 50 grams of extra weight probably a mixture of extra decoration on here um, although I'd say the other hilt's probably a similar weight but really probably the extra weight is coming from the extra width of this blade Right, so let's compare that with a foil. Um, this is, uh, I've got three here. Two of them are, I believe, part of a set. They're certainly almost identical, and they're made by the same company. Uh, they are British, and that one is French, okay? Or, uh, is it French? Yes, it is French, yeah. Um, so, uh, very similar design. You'll see that they both have what are called figure eight guards, which were very common in foils in this period. They both have leather buff leather um, liners which block the holes in those figure eight guards but you'll notice on the British ones for some reason the leather is at the top and I've researched I thought that was originally they'd been taken off and put back on the wrong way around they are supposed to be on the top because I can see pictures I can see photos of from the period of that being the case so in this one the leather's on the top on this one the leather's on the bottom I don't know why they should be different but they are um, right so these are the practice weapons that go with those small swords. These were the most common or one of the most common types of foil in use at the same time as the small sword was regularly being worn and used in duels. Okay, first of all, let's measure the length of the blades. They are all the same. Okay, so there seems to have been a standard length for, um, for foils, for fencing, for sporting purposes. And I believe that has remained the same. 
I'm going to do this this way because it's too it's proving to be too fiddly. Right. Yeah. So they are. 34 inch blades which I believe is the same as a modern foil and that is 86 86.5 centimeters or thereabouts okay so they're actually longer now I think that's interesting I d I've always wondered why are foils longer than small swords in general it's very rare to get a small sword with a 34 inch blade they're usually about 30 32 uh, sometimes even shorter the college mild i think is about 30 the other one's about 32 so um you know why did they make the foil blade slightly longer we don't know why did they make the foils square section instead of triangular maybe cheapness but then in the 19th century they were making practice epes with triangular blades why didn't they switch to those why did they keep using square blades for foils we don't know it could be something to do with the flexibility um it couldn't be economy because they were using triangular epe blades as well so it's difficult to assess why that should be the case. There must be some reason why they chose them. But anyway, um, so it's a long blade. Let's have a look at the weight. Okay, so this is made at Enfield. That was the Royal, the British Royal Small Arms Factory in Enfield. Um, and so these are, and they've got the War Department arrow on. So these are actually military purchase um, made in Enfield for the army. So these are for the army uh, gymnasiums um, for practicing foil fencing uh, probably uh, between 1860 and 1900 could be anywhere between those the design of the foils didn't really change right so the weight is 480 480 grams okay so um, that is the same weight or slightly more than the Kulish Mard and it's heavier than the Georgian small sword okay the foil is heavier than the small swords if we look at the point of balance I would say, if anything, it's closer to the guard than it is with the small swords. So the small swords are slightly lighter, but their point of balance is slightly further from the hand. The other thing to note as well with the foils is they're definitely longer hilts than a small sword generally is, as you'll see here. Okay, now my theory, some people discuss why. Why would that be the case? Why do they make the foil grips longer? My theory is it's because they use large padded gloves. First of all, why do they use large padded gloves? Well, it's my belief that these four blades, especially with steel of the 19th century and earlier, was not as reliable and was more liable to break. We know from 19th century accounts, they did often break. If you get a broken blade, you get a sharp point. If you're holding the sword in your hand and fencing, you don't really want a broken sharp point sticking in your hand. So they used leather, heavily padded gloves which are often seen as not necessary for modern foil fencing um, they just use light gloves these days but the blades are much more reliable and less likely to break in a sharp point using modern steel and uh, margin steel and things like this with traditional carbon steel of the of the 19th century when it breaks leaves a sharp point more likely to stick in your hand so you need a big padded glove if you've got a big padded glove you need a longer grip because your thumb, your fingers, the palm, everything is more padded and bigger. So my theory is that the longer grip uh, corresponds to the use of large padded gloves to protect the hand. But that's a theory that may not be 100% correct. Feel free to post underneath if you've got other theories for why they had particularly long grips on the practice weapon, uh, unlike on the, um, on the small sword. Another thing to mention is knuckle bows and finger rings okay if you're using large padded gloves you can't use finger rings and you can't use knuckle bows because you can't you can't fit the large padded glove in there okay so the practice weapons as far as i've seen uh, certainly of the 18th century never have knuckle bows and i've never seen one with finger rings okay the closest we get to it are the italian foils uh, which do have finger rings and crossbars and dish hilts and they look a bit more like a scaled down rapier okay so uh, so there we go so that one was 480 let's quickly weigh the other ones just to see if there's any variation in the foils okay so this one should be exactly the same because it looks exactly the same as made in the same place at the same time and indeed it is exactly the same it's 480 grams you'll notice just the cord bindings coming off this one unfortunately but that doesn't make any difference to the weight really nothing noticeable anyway so 480 grams again same weight or slightly higher than the small swords and this is the French one. I think this one might be slightly lighter, actually. It feels a bit lighter in the hand. And it is indeed 
Wow, and it's got a point of balance incredibly close. Look, the point of balance is incredibly close to the guard. It's there, it's next to the guard. That's the point of balance, okay? So the, this French one has a very different point of balance to those British ones. The British one's balanced about there, maybe about two fingers width from the, from the guard. The, um, the French one balances right next to the guard. And the total weight, it's actually quite difficult to weigh it for that reason. It doesn't want to balance on the scales, is, let's try this way. So it's 400 grams. So actually this one is lighter, quite noticeably so. The difference between 480 grams and 400 grams is, is actually quite a lot if you think about it in percentage terms. So this foil is lighter, but remember that this small sword was 420 grams and this, the lighter foil, is 400 grams. So there's not much difference. Um, and this has got a slightly longer blade and a slightly longer grip. In fact, quite a lot of longer grip. Um, but the foil is pretty much the same, very, very slightly lighter than this small sword. Right, okay, what we're going to do now, comparing like with like while we're at it, we're going to look at my old practice weapon, which is an epee blade with something similar to a foil hilt. Okay, in fact, I made that disc myself many years ago, uh, but it's got a similar length hilt, probably got a slightly heavier pommel than, than some of the historical ones do. First of all, let's look at the point of balance. The point of balance is actually quite far out, okay? It's probably a little bit further than the British military foils that we just looked at, and certainly it's about three fingers from the guard. Right, so let's have a, a um, weigh of this. So that's 400 grams. So it's a little bit on the light side actually, isn't it? So it's quite considerably lighter than the British military foils, like this. Um, the, the military foil has a thick um, uh, figure eight guard and maybe it has a heavier pommel actually. Um, the blades are the, almost the same length. In fact, the, this one is slightly shorter than the, I think the Epe is probably about 35 inches. I know I've gone back to Imperial, sorry, that's what my brain works in. Um, whereas the military foil is 34 inches. This is 19th century, remind you. So the modern Epe blade is slightly longer and it seems that the overall weapon is slightly lighter, okay? So this 400 grams, really, if I wanted to replicate this, I need to be adding another 80 grams to the, to the weapon. Where is that extra 80 grams? Well, I think most of it is around here. I think most of it's coming from that guard. So I think replicating that figure eight guard and then mounting it onto this sword would be the first thing to see. Does that give me a weapon which handles more like the original 19th century example? Right. Let's um, now, let's move on to the Epée de Combat, okay? So just to remind you that the Epée de Combat was something which came about in the 19th century, specifically in France for settling matters of honour, duels of honour, usually to first blood. This is what gives us modern Epée fencing and the idea of the full body target and the first person to hit because it's the first person that causes the bleeding wound is deemed the winner, as it were. So modern epee fencing very much comes out of this French culture of first blood dueling. It's a very different historical origin to foil fencing, which comes from the practice for small sword fencing. And also just to mention, in the era of small, small sword fencing, fencing, they didn't originally have fencing masks, which is why they don't count hits to the face. It's a traditional reason and a safety reason. Um, so they weren't wearing masks, so they didn't thrust at the face. When they did bring masks in, they still didn't thrust at the face, okay? Whereas with epee fencing, masks had been around for a while by them, and so they counted hits to the face as you do in sabre, and that's why in Olympic fencing, they count hits to the face or any other part of the body. Right, so uh, first of all, let's just have a look at the length of this. I think that this will be a 34 inch blade thereabouts. And let's see what that is in centimeters, because I need my tape measure to tell you. So it is indeed 34, maybe slightly over. It's around um, 87 centimetres, okay? So <clears throat> let's have a look at the point of balance. The point of balance is about one finger's width from the guard, okay? Now something we have to note is, as you'll see, the hilt of this um, Epée de Combat is modelled on a foil. It's not modelled on a small sword. So it doesn't really look anything like 
the earlier small sword hilt. What it does look like is the French foil hilt and in fact you'll see that the length of the grip is pretty much the same, the style of the grip, very square section, the way it's bound is even the same, um, but with a more protective guard. And just like with modern Epe, this is one of the things that differentiates Epe from foil, not just the blade, because the blade is less noticeable to most people, although the foil is a square blade and the Epe is a triangular blade, but it's the fact that the Epe, even the modern Epe, has a very large bowl guard, but even the early Epe's used for dueling still have a larger guard than the foil does, because the foil is a practice weapon, but also they tend to be larger than small swords were as well for whatever reason. And these Epe de Combat, they never have finger rings as far as I've seen. They all, they sometimes have a cross guard, a crossbar, but not very often. And they, I have never ever seen one with a knuckle bow, okay? They just have essentially a shell hilt. Right, so let's have a way of it and see where it comes in at. So it is heavier, it's a, it's a bigger object and that is quite a heavy, large guard. And it comes in at 550 grams. So this is actually considerably, in percentage terms, heavier than the small swords or any of the foils. This is a bigger weapon, okay? Right, finally, I'm not going to go into a great de deal of depth on these swords, on the sabre-hilted ones, because they're a thing of their own. They're a little bit different. It's not fair to compare them on the same terms because they have sabre hilts which are heavier, okay? Um, uh, but I do think it's fun to throw them in there just to see what they weigh anyway. Okay, so first of all, the Wilkinson made Scots Guards Colonel's Officer's Sword uh, with an Epe blade, quite similar to the Epe de Combat we've just seen here, but with a regulation um, Scots Guards Officer's Hilt with some adaptations. It's got an extra bar on the inside for extra protection. It's got squared grip, this kind of thing. But uh, let's have a look at the weight of that. Wow, surprising. Okay, so it's 480 grams, it's that magic number. So this, um, this Guards Officer's special epee bladed sword actually weighs the same as the, um, as the military issue foils. Okay, it weighs the same as them and it is very close to the Kulishmad as well. Very interesting. Um, I expected that to be heavier due to the style of the hilt, but it's actually not. And uh, let's have a little look at the French one. In fairness, I would say the French one's got a heavier hilt. The point of balance is quite far back. Well, it's not as far back as I thought it would be, in fairness. But in the hand, you feel like you've got quite a lot of mass here. And it's very light at the tip. Um, and it's a little bit shorter, in fairness. Um, if I put it next to it, it's probably a, at least about an inch and a half shorter than the British one. So let's weigh that. That comes in at 480 grams, amusingly. So um, it's this magic 480 grams. So interestingly, that is basically the same. It might be a shade under, it might be like 470, but it's close enough. Um, that's the same weight as the British one, same weight more or less as the Kolishmad, same weight as the British foil um, practice foil. So there we go. I hope that's been um, somewhat interesting. We're looking at, um, I think the two headline things for me to conclude on are that um, foils of the 18th and 19th century are quite different to epées. Uh, most people practicing small sword fencing these days use epé blades on foil hilts or variations thereof. Maybe we should look at using foil blades and see, you know, try and understand why were they using foil blades instead of epé blades, given that they had access to epé blades. Um, but secondly, I think the weight issue is very interesting. I mean, obviously, I've only looked at 18th and 19th century examples here, but within the 18th and 19th century, small swords seemed to be between, very often between 400 and 500 grams, as do fencing foils. So fencing foils correspond in weight. Um, fencing foils seem to balance in general a little bit closer to the hand than small swords do, but the weight is very, very similar. Um, and fencing foils interesting a little bit longer than small swords generally were. We don't know why that was. And later in the 19th century, when some officers decided to have these kind of dueling blades put on their dress swords, those swords equally fall into the same weight, weight category of around 480 grams. Um, so right the way from, you know, 1700, or should we say about 1720, right the way through to about 1900, there is this kind of, this culture of the dueling, the thrust only dueling sword, be it a foil or a, a small sword or a, a epée de combat, which falls into this sort of weight range and this sort of size. Hope that's been interesting. See you guys soon. 
Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. We have extra videos on Patreon and you can follow us on Facebook.